Welcome to the Rock Coding YouTube channel. My name is Anton. In the previous video, we talked about functional programming and the benefits that it brings. And I mentioned we're going to be taking a look at metaprogramming. This is what this video is about. And hopefully the idea of having a program run before the program will heavily rely on metaprogramming at some point. And the reason metaprogramming is so useful is you can take a look at the input, take a look at the output and just write a program that is going to fill in the blanks in the middle. How you develop this sort of solution? Well, we're going to do it in this video. So if you're enjoying the video, don't forget to leave a like and subscribe. If you have any questions, make sure to leave them in the comment section. Don't forget to check out the description. I have a C Sharp course that is out. If you would like to know C Sharp as I do, I highly recommend you take a look at it. With that, let's go ahead and get started. I realized that the browser is effectively the light theme and nobody is complaining about the browser blinding you. And personally, in my time, I use the light theme. I enjoy it. So I'm going to be using the light theme now. And for all of you that are like, oh, it's hurting my eyes, grow up. So we're going to take the solution that we had in the previous video. If you haven't watched the previous video, the idea is that we have some kind of vector. We have a graph that stores all of these vectors, and then we have a bunch of parameters, which we want to query this vector by. The premise for using metaprogramming is if we want to add another property to the vector, or if we want to add another model, we would have to add perhaps another endpoint. We would have to add another parameter here. Maybe we will need to create new conditions. The idea is that whatever parameters we have and whatever models we have, we can put them to the sides and then write a program that is going to fill in the blanks. So let's get our first thing out of the way, which is going to be input. For this, we will accept an HTTP request. So let's just say that this is a request. And generally, when you're going to be doing metaprogramming, you're going to be in this dynamic land where the only way to bridge it is by using some kind of a string enum number value where you can retrieve that pre-built type. But up until then, everything is disconnected by this dynamic layer, kind of like electricity and the socket that you plug in for your electronic devices. And here we will be taking a look at the query and for each key value. So yep, I mean, this is going to be key and values. Values in this case is going to be string values. So the way that you extract a single value from there is, is you say something like this. So values, semicolon on the end here. if something, something, we want to go ahead and do something like this. All right. So what is this something, something? What are we retrieving? We are retrieving create X condition and create X condition is this thing over here. We need a predicate and we select this predicate by the key. What we actually want is a query parameter map. So in the spirit of this being a program before our program, we're actually going to <laughs> lift this up before our program. And at the top, we are going to define our query parameter map, which is going to be this new dictionary where the key is going to be this key over here. So it's a string which should map to some kind of condition. So this predicate over here, which we have extracted from this return type semicolon on the end here. If we want to, we can take this type and shorten it. So using query predicates or something like that, place the type over here. I think we will need to put the full name qualifiers over here and then query predicates. We just say that bada bang, bada boom. Uh, we are just newing up this thing. Uh, let's give this a little bit more space. We are going to be accepting our query predicates over here. So query and predicates. Writers are really not helping me with the names over there. Uh, we're going to go to the query predicates. We're going to try to get value for the key. Out var comes the predicate. And this is really a predicate factory, right? So the return type is a function, which is going to take this string, this value that is coming in here, and it's going to create a predicate or maybe at least get the cached one based on this incoming value. Here, what we've essentially done kind of like in test driven development, what you do is you build up a test and then you write code against the test. This is effectively our unit test. What we have done is we've created the interface which we want to work with. And this value, let's just say if is null or empty, we'll place this over here. And this is not one too many braces on here. And there we have it. 
These are all the inputs. We then take our vector 3D, we go to the top here and we start working against the other end, which are essentially the properties. We go to our type of vector 3D, we get all of the properties that we want to generate our solution for. So properties, uh, let's say properties for each and we have this property info. What do we actually want to do here? How is this going to look like? What we're trying to actually fit is this query parameter map. And this, by the way, let's just register it right now before I forget. Again, we're trying to fill this out and the string over here relates to the query parameters and the string also relates to this X, Y, and Z properties on the vector 3D. So where we can start is say that the query map property, not properties, uh, property info name to lower. This is going to be the key that is going to accept some kind of input. So for now, uh, let's leave this commented out that this is where we're aiming, where uh, we want some kind of string over here. Maybe actually not leave this commented out, but uh, leave some kind of a blank thing here that is just going to compile, right? So we're returning a null function for this function over here. The string that we're going to have coming in is the actual value from the query string. So we can start looking for these letters that we're getting here. So var letter, this is going to come from the string zeroth position. And then the number is going to come from string uh, the rest of the position. One thing that I think I did very poorly over here is how I said that, look, we have the E, L and G flags over here. Uh, let's put them at the top here. And I said, look, what you really want are these equals less than or greater than signs. So you kind of want this mapping. And uh, what we have over here is this mapping is, well, <laughs> way over here and we kind of lost out of the back. So what I want to do for this video is actually try to keep it as close as possible. The way that this could be done is again, just uh, trying to focus on what we have here and then just the actual constraints. We're going to get a comparison. I'm really struggling with the spelling over here. So this is going to be our character. Let's give this a body and let's switch on this character, we'll have this switch statement over here. And the thing that we're going to return is previously chord select is going to return a number in the end. And then here where we're parsing, uh, we also just get a number. So really, we just want two numbers in. So we get a function number in number in, and then a Boolean out. So we just want to return a function. Uh, C sharp is going to be able to figure out that uh -huh, you actually want uh, two parameters, so like A and B, and then oh, not BB, and then have that compared. All right, with a function like that, uh, let's uh, replace these two bodies. This is going to be less than, more than. Format this out. Uh, we can convert this to expression body, and if we really want to be descriptive, we can create a actual kind of <laughs> I don't know, kind of like a unit. So we return a boolean equal accept two integers A and integer B and have the comparison over here. And do the same for less than and then greater than. Uh, let's move the comparisons over here. Uh, let's take uh, both of these, move to the next error. Maybe take about yay much, paste this over here, comma, and there we have it. So now we can see that E equates to equals, L equates to less than, and G equates to greater than. We can also generate this default thing over here just so it stops screaming at us. So once we have the get comparison, we can place this over here. We have the string. I just pass it because, you know, uh, what's the point of uh, storing the letter over here? We have the comparison and we have a single parameter for this comparison, which is this number over here, which we can parse out of the rest of the string. The next thing that we need is an actual vector and the vector is coming from the function that we're returning. So the string that is coming here, the result of it should be a function which accepts a vector and returns some kind of Boolean. Obviously, it shouldn't actually look like that. We are going to be doing comparisons on it. So vector, perhaps, uh, let's say for now, because we're just accepting two numbers, we're going to take the x and the number that is coming in. And there we go. 
But the X, the Y, the Z that we're getting over here is actually going to come from this property info over here. So what we want to construct is this Lambda, which is going to get us an accessor to the property value. So if we have this vector 3D, we can actually do this with expressions. If we go to expressions, we create a property, which is this vector parameter, which is going to be type of vector. And sorry, not property parameter, var vec param. Once we have the vector parameter, we can say that we want whatever property we have over here. So this property info, we want to access that on our parameter that we are supplying. So to the expression, we say that we want a parameter. It is going to be for this parameter that we're supplying, and it's going to be this property info that we already have access to. And sorry, this is not parameter uh, property. We're accessing a property on the parameter. This is property access. And then we're going to go for the property value. So property value, again, on the expression, but this time we're going to create a lambda, which is going to be this function over here. Again, we are going to be taking in a vector and then we're going to be returning the integer value behind this property. So the first parameter can be just the property axis. And then the second parameter is going to be the vec param that we're passing over here. So vec param in property axis here, and then we have the property value here. All we're doing is we're taking this property value function and we're passing the vector into there. Uh, this accessor that we're creating or this function that is going to be accessing the value of the property, we can actually compile it into a function. And then we have something like this. Once you have all of this, uh, let's go ahead and get rid of the rest of the stuff that we had here. Uh, this should be it, I think. Uh, let's open up the terminal. So the application has restarted. Uh, let's give this a go. So we have x larger than five or less than five, sorry, greater than five and equals five. If we do something like ask for a w, well, clearly we don't have a W and we don't have anything to filter by the W. So let's actually come in here and we're going to say that we want a W now. And there's going to be an extra set of parameters that we want to fill it by. Uh, let's come back over here and refresh. And there we have it. So W equals five and the query is automatically working for it. Let's see if there is a cross crossover between uh, x being five and w being five big fat exception obviously i didn't specify the e but looks like there is no crossover let's say where x is less than five so there we go w is five and in both of these cases x is actually zero so i could have typed in a query that says something like this and this will be it for this video thank you very much for watching hopefully you've enjoyed it and this gives you a little bit of a clearer idea that if you're in a situation where you have your domain model and then you have a bunch of input and you have this space in the middle that needs to be filled. You don't go in to that space and you start creating these wirings manually. You take a step back, a look at it as a big picture and you create a program which runs before the actual program runs, which is going to create a program which fits that space, right? So just a program that creates a puzzle piece that you fit in the middle rather than doing all of the implementations yourself. You're rather working with the rules and then assembling them. As always, don't forget, if you enjoyed the video, leave a like and subscribe. If you have any questions, make sure to leave them in the comment section. If you would like to get the source code for this video, as well as my other videos, please come support me on Patreon. I will really appreciate it. And a very big and special thank you goes out to all of my current Patreon supporters. You help me make these videos. As always, thank you for watching. Have a good day.